Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Associate Museum Director for Public Programming here at the Carlos, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you um, here tonight at the museum and on Zoom. Before we begin, I would like to draw our attention to Emory University's land acknowledgement. Emory University acknowledges the Muscogee Creek people who lived, worked, produced knowledge on, and nurtured the land where Emory's Oxford and Atlanta campuses are now located. In 1821, 15 years before Emory's founding, the Muscogee were forced to relinquish this land. We recognize the sustained oppression, land dispossession, and involuntary removals of the Muscogee and Cherokee peoples from Georgia and the Southeast. Emory seeks to honor the Muscogee Nation and other indigenous caretakers of this land by humbly seeking knowledge of their histories and committing to respectful stewardship of the land. Over the last few months, I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Ari Saikawa, Associate Professor in Emory's Department of Environmental Studies and Director of the Emory Climate Talks Initiative to bring tonight's speaker to campus. Thanks to you, Ari and Leah Thomas for all of your efforts to make pro tonight's program, which connects the ancient and the contemporary worlds a reality. We are honored to welcome tonight's speaker, Dion Searcy. Dion was raised in Nebraska and now lives in Brooklyn, but she has covered the world. She has covered a range of topics, including women suicide bombers in West Africa, victims of game warfare in Chicago, a fiscal crisis in Long Island, checkpoint killings of civilians in Iraq, overseas corporate corruption, patent disputes, insider trading, asbestos litigation fraud, and the 2010 earthquake in Haiti and hurricanes Katrina and Sandy. She started her career in journalism as a crime reporter at the City News Bureau of Chicago, moving from there to the Chicago Tribune. She was a political reporter at Newsday and the Seattle Times before joining the staff of the Wall Street Journal as an investigative reporter and national legal correspondent. In 2014, she moved to the New York Times, serving as the paper's West Africa Bureau Chief from 2015 to 2019, covering social, political, and economic issues in 25 countries in West and Central Africa, with a focus on Nigeria's war against Boko Haram. In 2020, Random House published Dion's memoir of those years, titled In Pursuit of Disobedient Women, a memoir of love, rebellion, and family far away. Dion has won numerous awards for her work, including the Michael Kelly Award for Courage in International Reporting, the Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award for International Reporting, and a citation for her work by the Overseas Press Club. She and a team of Times journalists were nominated for an Emmy for their stories on Boko Haram, and they won the Pulitzer Prize in Journalism for International Reporting in 2020. Her topic tonight, which she has written about extensively for the Times in recent years, is the mining of cobalt, lithium, and other minerals that are supposed to help us extricate ourselves from the carbon economy. And yet the mining of these minerals is hardly benign. Last week in this room, we heard from the curator of antiquities at the Getty, Ken Lapitan, about some of the horrors relating to the mining of gemstones in the ancient world. Welcome, Dion, tonight to talk with us about what we are mining now. Hi, thank you so much for having me um, and welcoming me to this amazing campus and this very cool um, museum that you have. Thanks, I really appreciate it. So these photos that are scrolling as I speak are just a collection of photographs from my um, really wonderful colleague and good friend, Ashley Gilbertson, an Australian photographer who um, takes a lot of pictures for the New York Times and I have worked with quite extensively. They are all from a trip that we took last year to the Democratic Republic of Congo to explore mining there. Um, so minerals, metals, and gems hold a particular kind of intrigue in our society. In America, getting married traditionally means a diamond ring and a gold band. Um, for us, silver, gold, rubies, and sapphires, emeralds, all that, they conjure these um, 
you know, visions of princesses or treasure chests. And we see this from the time we're little um, in, in storybooks and cartoons. Um, we see it in Hollywood through James Bond capers in the movies um, where everyone's always asked after some kind of diamond. And um, of course, these tales don't always include this often unpleasant backstory to getting those precious items out of the ground and the struggle over who will profit from them. And it's a cycle that has repeated itself many times through history. And it's one we're on course for again, right now. Um, today, the push for renewable energy, this global transition away from polluting oil and gas has created a worldwide scramble for a new kind of material that we find underground, the minerals and metals that will power the clean energy revolution lithium, nickel, and the metal I want to talk to you about tonight, cobalt. Right now, it's in high demand. Uh, hmm. Do you want to somebody help with that? <laughs> okay. So right now, cobalt is in high demand. Um, I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo last year to look into who was after this metal. And um, it's a metal that not many people know exists. It's not one that we hear about a lot, but it's key to the clean energy revolution and how that was changing lives in the country um, and in this country that has an awful lot of it in Congo. So cobalt is a grayish colored rock that is often found alongside copper in deep veins underground. Its value for this new age of clean energy comes when it's used in batteries. The cobalt used for cell phones and for laptops triggered a craze of its own, but cobalt is particularly important to the, to the auto manufacturing industry. It helps keep batteries from overheating. But even more critical is the fact that an electric car, um, if you use cobalt in the battery of this car, it extends the range of the battery. That is, a car can go 200 or 300 miles without needing a charge because of cobalt. That's super important to the auto manufacturing industry because everybody knows that the biggest, everybody's biggest fear about buying an electric vehicle is that you're gonna run out of batteries on the side of the road. Um, it's gonna lose its juice, right? So cobalt is a thing that makes sure that that won't happen right now. The world is moving away from gas guzzling, the gas guzzling combustion engine. In China, electric vehicles already dominate the roadways. In the US, Ford and other major auto manufacturers, almost every one of them have, convert, uh, have pledged to convert to um, electric only fleets. In just a matter of a few years, um, there's legislation in California that talks about um, how EVs need to be on the roads in a couple of years from now. So the demand for cobalt has skyrocketed. We are living in an era of a cobalt rush, if you will. So I'm a reporter, I'm not an activist or an academic or a scientist. I'm not gonna offer you arguments and solutions for mining problems um, that have huge consequences for geopolitical relationships for the people living in the areas where cobalt is found. And really even, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say for the fate of humanity and our planet. Um, but I can present a set of facts to you from months of research and from my on the ground reporting, from talking to people with shovels and pickaxes emerging from deep tunnels in the ground, all the way up to talking to people in their fancy office towers and presidential palaces, people in the highest rungs of political power. And I hope this is helpful to you in peeling back the layers of what is behind this new kind of industrial revolution that we're all trying to find our place in. Here is the main thing you need to know about cobalt. 80% of the entire world's supply of cobalt is found in one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo a Central African country that is huge geographically and it's also huge population wise. It's a poor country um, and there's a lot of inequality there too. There's definitely um, a, 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 an elite few who have money. So cobalt is found also in a few other places in Russia and Australia and in Canada. There's even a little bit of it in Idaho. But I'm in, I want to give you an example of just how much cobalt is um, in DRC. So you might've seen a picture of a, a marching band earlier um, with a big black mountain behind it. Um, so I was driving down a road in, um, 
in the southeast region of Congo where you uh, where all the mines are and the it's a very very flat area nothing like geographically significant that nature made there to look at and um, all of a sudden our road dead ended into this big black mountain and we're like what is this and we got out and asked this marching band that was performing there and they told us that was actually, we were on a state mining site. Um, there was a state mine nearby and that was a tailings pile. And I don't know if you know what a tailings pile, but a tailings pile is actually like a trash heap. When you dig um, rock out of the ground, you take the rocks you want and then you put the rest of the soil and other ground in a pile. It had amassed into a mountain, but there was so much cobalt in this garbage heap essentially that the state was going to start mining that trash heap. And the crazy thing about that situation is that there was more cobalt in that trash heap than exists in the entire countries of some of those places that I named that also has cobalt. So Congo has a lot of cobalt. So, and it's not just any cobalt. The, the cobalt in Congo is high grade, pure, easy to extract because it's close to the surface of the ground. It doesn't cost as much to dig it up. Um, it's it's pure in grade, so it, you don't have to use as many expensive chemicals to separate it. It's just easier to get to, so and, and pure and better than cobalt in most other places. Um, I stepped out of the car in one at one mine in the parking lot and realized as I was walking across the parking lot, um, some of the gravel crunching underneath my feet was actual little pieces of cobalt. That's how much cobalt there is in some parts of of um, DRC. So Congo's soil is literally bursting with cobalt and with many minerals and metals. In Congo, you can find copper, lithium, gold, diamonds, malachite, iron ore, tourmaline, which is this watermelon colored gem that I didn't even know existed before I went to um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So volcanic ash action in the earth zillions of years ago created this unbelievable array of gems and minerals and metals, pretty much unlike anywhere else in earth. <laughs> I've reported on hunts for minerals and metals and gems in the past. Um, I've been in the mines of the Central African Republic to track down who is profiting from diamonds. I've, um, and, and in the Central African Republic, it was um, oligarchs, Russian oligarchs working for um, President Putin. I've climbed the hillsides in Senegal to get to mines where regular people were blasting the earth with C4 explosives and using mercury with their bare hands to separate out the gold. It was dangerous work, but to the people, it was worth it. I wanted to see who was after cobalt in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I went there um, and trying to see like who are the players getting involved around the edges of these things. Um, and, and usually it's wealthy entrepreneurs like in any kind of big rush, like a gold rush in, in the days of old who are trying to get a piece of things. Now, one of my favorite parts of reporting is turning up to a place after I've made some phone calls and talked to experts and done all my reporting from my little office chair in Midtown Manhattan and arriving to the scene to realize that I was absolutely dead wrong. Um, I just think that the it, it shows me kind of the thrill of getting out of my chair, getting on the ground and talking to real people about their lives, just being absolutely wrong and having my mind changed and realizing what the real story is. But when I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo to look into the wild west of investing in cobalt, um, I had to tell you that I was completely 100% right. I had a feeling that all the wealthy um, people going after this metal were going to be at the fanciest hotel in town. And I walked into, I checked into that hotel. Um, it's called the Flov Hotel, um, which means river. It was right by the Congo River. And wow, was I ever right. Um, the hotel had these seven um, sparkly chandeliers, not just one giant chandelier, but seven chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. The hotel manager was hanging, handing out cigars outside. As I was checking in, there was a guy in a white suit um, walked in with kind of like swoopy hair and he had loafers on um, without any socks. You know, those guys that wear those fancy loafers without socks. Um, and 
workers were rolling out a red carpet for a visiting president. And as soon as that guy walked in, they rolled it up really quickly and um, rolled out another fancier red carpet for another visiting president. People were sipping whiskey at the bar and snacking on $29 cheeseburgers. The restaurant had a chef that the man was imported from Italy to make like polenta and all this other stuff. And the breakfast bar had Swiss yogurt and muesli. This is in a city where most people live hand to mouth, mind you. So out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a meeting at a table at the restaurant. It was a mining lawyer, a local Congolese mining lawyer. And across the table from him was the NBA star Dikembe Mutombo, who you might know um, from basketball fame of the yeah, Atlanta Hawks. I believe. Um, so uh, Dikembe is very easy to recognize. He's like more than seven feet tall. So I spotted him right away. And as it turns out, he had been partnering with um, a fundraiser for President Trump to strike a cobalt deal. And he was working on that deal. Um, I looked at the hotel's Instagram account. The R&B singer called Akon, I don't know if you know him, but he had posted photos from the hotel. He's very popular in... Um, in uh, abroad and also in the US. And a quick Google search led me to a website that talked about Akon's hopes for a major cobalt venture. I saw in uh, one corner of the hotel, one of the president's advisors, the Congolese president's advisors, huddling in a meeting with another government minister. That advisor ran an investment fund that had mining interests, including cobalt. So I was standing under one of the chandeliers watching this crazy scene uh, play out and a guy um, walked up next to me and just sort of struck up a conversation as we were both standing there. He had come in from Nigeria, he said, and um, but he was French and I kind of carried on. And I said, oh, I, I'm from New York. Um, what are you doing here? I'm a journalist. And he said, he looked at me like I was completely crazy and said, I'm here for cobalt. So all these guys in their fancy suits and their sockless loafers and, and whatever were really late to the game. What they didn't realize and what I didn't realize until I started looking into this story is that there's a hidden history of the hunt for cobalt. And how this hunt for all the metals and minerals began decades ago involves and involves the highest levels of government of several powerhouse nations. And it also involves a local population that has really rarely benefited. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that hidden history. Um, a long time ago during Co Congo's colonial days, Belgian mining executives arrived and called the country a geological scandal. And that's because it just was so bursting with so many different kinds of minerals and metals. And they decided to take full advantage Hans Zellner, in his book, described the entire country as a forced labor camp with Belgians building, and I'm going to quote from the book, an empire of mills, furnaces, and rails in the bush. Locals were paid the equivalent of 20 cents a day to break rocks and push carts. It amounted to a version of debt slavery. Taxes were kept purposefully high, and workers were not permitted to select their own occupations. The men slept eight to a hut in settlements ringed with barbed wire to prevent them from leaving before their contracts were up. Typhoid and dysentery were rampant. That's what he wrote about this colonial era. The name of that book I just quoted from, by the way, is called Uranium, because yes, uranium is also found in Congo. And in fact, the, the very uranium that Americans used to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came in fact from Congo. It wasn't just the Belgians who were after Congo's natural resources. America has a long history of going after Congo's minerals and metals. My colleague, Eric Lipton at the New York Times uncovered even a telegram that Albert Einstein had written to FDR in 1939, seeking, um, urging him to stockpile Congolese uranium. I'm gonna read that telegram. It said, the United States has only very poor ores of uranium in moderate quantities, Einstein wrote. There is some good ore in Canada and the former Czechoslovakia, while the most important source of uranium is in Belgian Congo. So in 1960, more than two decades after Einstein wrote that telegram, Congo gained independence from Belgium. The US for all those years had been eyeing Congo's resources, not just uranium, but it's cobalt, it's copper and other materials that had military and industrial value. Um, they were used in jets and other things. 
America knew they were valuable, and at this time, the Cold War was raging. Access to Congo's minerals and metals became a key priority for, that, for the administrations. By the mid-60s, check this out, um, the, the CIA had set up one of its most extensive operations in Congo, secretly bankrolling a small army of mercenaries and Congolese troops. The agency ran missions with help of U.S. warplanes to suppress Soviet-backed rebels. Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State back then, warned President Nixon, according to a transcript of a classified exchange, which I will read to you, it said, if Zaire, Congo, this is back when Congo was called Zaire, if Zaire goes, every, every African state will draw the conclusion that the Soviet Union is the wave of the future. So Congo's role in the Cold War was, was pretty intense. Um, in 1970, President Nixon and his wife greeted President Mobutu Seso Seko with a giant bouquet of roses on the White House lawn. Mobutu by then had stolen more than half of the value of his country's entire national budget, but the US welcomed him anyway, with not just roses, but they flew him all around the country and even to Disneyland. So not only did Mobutu control all of the natural resources in Congo, but he'd become a key intermediary for the US to block the Soviet Union from making inroads in Africa. Mobutu saw the US as a good partner to help um, grow the country's mining wealth. So it was this win-win situation. Corporate America smelled the opportunity. Citibank, General Motors, Goodyear, and others set up manufacturing outposts in Congo Pan Am even set up a hotel um, intercontinental with U.S. financing in Kinshasa, the capital of Congo. Pan Am used to fly to Kinshasa regularly. The U.S. had their eye on a stretch of land called the Tenke Fungarume Mine, um, or the, the Tenke Fungarume Concession back then. In the southeast part of the country, it was named for two villages that it sat between Tenke and Fungarume. The site was the size of the city of Los Angeles, and its potential for exploitation of copper and cobalt was off the charts. It was overflowing with the metals. It's that place where I got out of the parking lot and cobalt was crunching under my feet. So bankers and diplomats flew into Congo's mining capital, but Belgium was still in the picture back then and still quite eager for the same mine site. They pounced and Mobutu struck a deal with the Belgians and not the, the Americans but the US did not give up. They went to work wooing Mobutu and Congolese officials. They funneled millions of dollars to Mobutu. They sent him C-130 airplanes. And one of those C-130 airplanes are those big lumbering cargo military airplanes. It was filled with $60,000 worth of Coca-Cola. That was Mobutu's request. America financed a nearly billion dollar project to string electricity to the area of the mine concession. There were even rumors of bribes paid. Whatever Mobutu wants, give it to him. That's how one of um, a diplomat in Congo at the time told us, the New York Times, about how Nick Nixon had been signaling his administration. America wanted this mine site and their tactics worked. US investors were allowed to set up a mine. But, and when mining executives got to the area, we talked to the ones who were some of the first people to arrive. They just marveled at what they saw. There were these um, grassy hills that were bald at the top and they thought it was weird. And they climbed to the top of those hills and realized it was bald because there was copper and cobalt literally poking through the tops of those hills. So a few decades passed. And the mines development had some ups and downs. There were investors who had backed out, um, rebels over, Bankers even financed rebels to help overthrow Mobutu, American bankers. Um, another civil war happened. Um, people came and went. But let's fast forward to 2006. And an American firm called Freeport McMoran became the largest holder of the mine concession. America, at long last, in 2006, finally had firmly secured what it had been after all those years. So when Freeport McMoran showed up, life for the Congolese people changed as they went to work. The area that was once this really sleepy collection of communities of farmers exploded into a mining boom town. Freeport um, built roads and power plants, even a new vegetable market. It was this double-decker, like two-story um, market, what had been 
an open air market and they gave it a concrete base and they put a roof over it. So everything was protected during the rainstorms. And really they were trying to accommodate this influx of workers who arrived with their families, who they needed to work, but also who came from all over the country to work there. Freeport also relocated the residents who were living on the mining concession to new communities. They built them new concrete homes, they built schools and they built health clinics something people had never, ever had before. But as you can imagine, the relocation was not a smooth process. They were literally kicking people out of their homes and moving there somewhere else. Yeah, they were concrete homes, um, but there were no deeds issued. When the people got to those houses, they were like, do I own this? There was nothing legal to prove to them that they weren't going to be kicked out again. Um, a bunch of different communities were moved all into one set of one area. So places that had been distinct villages had suddenly were suddenly smushed together. And people told me that um, the, the village leaders, the mayors essentially of these communities were like, well, who's the boss now? And there were a lot of fights like duking it out over that. And one of the most heartbreaking things I think I learned is the residents were asking me if I knew what had happened to their cemeteries. And I was like, what are you talking about? Their cemeteries were not moved. So they're, the places that they left behind their loved ones, their, all their relatives um, who had passed away were in now what was a massive industrial mine site. Um, fights broke out also. People in nearby communities quickly realized that what was underground was very, very valuable there. Men and children were sneaking in to steal rocks of cobalt. The mine was so big, um, I think I said, or if I didn't, I forgot to say, it was the size of the city of Los Angeles, right? So it was huge, this area. So the mine was so big, they couldn't possibly control the borders and people were sneaking in to steal um, to steal the, the cobalt and people were digging tunnels. When the rains would come, the tunnels would collapse and people died. And this was on you know, the watch of this American company. Um, so, but here is the thing, for the bulk of the population, the mine offered jobs, thousands of jobs, some 7,000 jobs. Everyone either worked at the mine or knew someone who worked at the mine and kind of benefited economically a bit um, from like selling vegetables or driving a taxi or whatever to workers who arrived. Kids were being educated because of the schools Freeport built. Freeport, the US company, paid for healthcare and they fed lunch to their employees. Workers got to bring their families to tour the mine. It was a special event. Um, they had holiday parties. They had work anniversaries and they commemorated them with gifts. One worker told me he got a mini fridge on, I think it was like his fifth year of working there. Um, one of the metallurgists that I, I got to know told me that it was like this American style office culture that was imported into a place that had never had anything like that. And at first people were really freaked out and didn't like it, but they grew to really, really enjoy it. And for the most part, people really liked the sense of community that the company had um, brought there. Freeport took on more. They, buy, they bought an undeveloped area in the forest, this giant chunk of forest that underneath it contained one of the biggest reserves of cobalt in the entire world. With that purchase, much of the cobalt in the whole planet was in the hands of a US company. This could have perfectly positioned America for this moment in time. It could have helped America secure its place in this new global economy. But while Freeport was building a cobalt empire in Congo, a few things happened that turned America's attention elsewhere. For starters, 9-11. The attacks of September 11th on the World Trade Center and Pentagon shifted, had shifted the country's attention away from Africa and turned it to Afghanistan and the Middle East. The Cold War was replaced by the war on terror. We launched a war in Afghanistan, another war in Iraq, we battled Al-Qaeda and later the Islamic State. And we worried about oil. We fracked like crazy. We drilled for offshore oil. We drilled for oil in national parks. Freeport, the American mining company in Congo wanted in. And in 2012, it bought a bunch of oil and gas companies. But two years later, if you recall what happened in 2014, um, oil prices tanked. So it was this very, very poorly timed investment and Freeport had a huge problem. It could not find a buyer for its oil companies. 
So it solved it by offering up for sale its cobalt mines in Congo. Freeport had no issues at all finding a buyer. A Chinese company called China Mali was ready with the highest bid, largely because it had billions of dollars in state-backed loans. And in fact, executives who took part in the deal told us that the only serious bidders were Chinese companies. So a Chinese company took over the mine, and with that, purchased, with that purchase, it positioned itself to be a leader in the new economy. And all those Chinese companies, by the way, some of them were state-owned, but all of them had state backing, like billions and billions of dollars um, in state backing. And China had made this very calculated and very deliberate plan to lead the way in the clean energy um, economy and in electric cars and renewables. Nearly a decade before, a policy speech detailed China's plan to transform itself into a manufacturing superpower in 10 areas. One of them was batteries for electric vehicles. So back in 2015, China was thinking about this. It was, a, it was this very, um, I think, ahead strategy that they had. I want to pause here and go back to what the U.S. was doing at that time, almost at the exact same time that China was making it a national policy to focus on the clean energy revolution, to focus on batteries for electric vehicles. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at exactly, is that okay? At exactly the same moment in America when China was making this policy, Top scientists and officials in seven federal agencies under the Obama administration were in the middle of interviewing industry experts, academics, and researchers to identify essential raw materials that were vulnerable to shortages or interruptions. Cobalt emerged high on that list. Freeport sold the first of its big cobalt assets, the giant Tenke Fungarume mine that I mentioned um, during the Obama administration. By the time those scientists had made their official recommendations to put cobalt on a list of critical minerals, like minerals that were critical in the national security, Donald Trump was president. Now Trump agreed with their findings and he signed off on them. He created that list. But Donald Trump was a guy who, when he ran for president, made a lot of fossil fuel commitments. He even promised to bring back coal. Um, there's a famous um, video of him at one campaign stop where he famously told coal workers, you're going to be working your asses off again. Freeport's second major sale of its cobalt reserves in that undeveloped forest area I told you about, that took place during the Trump administration. So it was documented that Americans of both political persuasions knew how important cobalt was. Yet the nation's direct pathway to some of the biggest cobalt assets in the world was more or less handed over to China while no one was paying attention. When we pointed this out to numerous U.S. officials um, in government now and before, they were horrified. Some of them blamed straight up capitalism as, as the reason for this. Low level U.S. diplomats sound, had sounded alarms um, about the sale of these cobalt assets in the State Department. Congolese mining managers all but begged the American ambassador in Congo to intercede. We talked to numerous officials who said they felt like their hands were tied. America doesn't have a vehicle for helping private enterprises. Yet, I feel like I've been a reporter long enough to know um, that America can pretty much do whatever it wants. And a quick tour through WikiLeaks will show you how ambassadors around the world um, shepherd around oil company executives to um, meetings with politicians and the like. But the truth of what happened in Congo is that America's collective attention was elsewhere. By the time of the sale of the mine in 2015, we had largely abandoned the African continent outside of some um, aid for food and pumping up troop levels to beat back Islamist extremism. Our engagement was either charity or brute force. When I first called the American embassy in Congo to try to get them to talk to me about our stories, the economic division of the embassy there had no one in it except for the husband of a diplomat who is given one of those, they call them spouse jobs um, to keep the partners busy. That was the only person that was in the economic division. 
the, was you know, the husband of a diplomat who is manning the fort. U.S. involvement in Congo, as well as almost in every country in sub-Saharan Africa, was non-existent. Part of this was a function of focusing on ridding Congo of corrupt leaders. That's what diplomats told me. New overseas corruption laws had passed in the US, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Dodd-Frank. They had scared companies from investing in countries with less than ideal reputations on corruption. So the thinking went, if the US could push out these corrupt leaders, they would make a path for foreign investment um, for the US to help get back in track there. Mobutu had plundered Congo's coffers, it's true. And the presidents who followed, Laurent Kabila and his son, Joseph, who took over after he was assassinated, had done the same. The new president um, now, Felix Chisichetti, was more or less installed by the US and other entities after a very wobbly democratic election that most everyone agrees was fraudulent. He was a longtime opposition leader though, and the Americans had high hopes for him and still do. But I'd like to recall for you a story that exemplifies the differences in the mindsets of Chinese and Americans in their recent dealings with Congo. So this takes place at the inauguration of Joseph Kabila back in 2006. The Americans arrived so unprepared that the dignitary they had sent to um, to you know, congratulate him and go to the ceremony. You know, these inauguration ceremonies, usually people fly in from all, all, all countries, they send representatives um, out of respect. So she um, was so unprepared for everything that was going on in Congo. She had forgot to, she was invited by President Kabila to stay a second day and have a private meeting with him. But she had forgotten to bring along a second work outfit and had to borrow a work outfit from an assistant so that she could look fresh and new, um, I guess, the next the next day that she met with him. Um, the thing that she had brought along with her to give to Mr. Kabila was a little toy motorcycle. It was like this little Harley Davidson replica, like a Mac, not a Max matchbox car, but, you know, something similar like that. Um, so. Chinese officials arrived and they met with a newly minted president, but they walked away with an agreed upon framework of a $6 billion minerals for infrastructure deal. Um, it, it was almost a blueprint for Belt and Road that you hear about today. And that's what their, their thinking was at that inauguration ceremony. So today, China controls something like 15 out of the 19 cobalt mines in Congo. China's goal is to control the global supply chain from the metal, metals in the ground to the batteries themselves, no matter where the vehicles are made. The approach is kind of like, if you recall Henry Ford, when he was buying up rubber plantations, he wanted to control the, the vehicle from the tires on up, um, the entire supply chain. And that's a little bit like China, what China is doing with EVs. China also operates the biggest electric vehicle battery plants in the world that are already up and running. I'll tell you about one industrial mine site that we, I would say stumbled upon, but we didn't really stumble upon it, we trespassed. Um, but we, it, it's that forest that I mentioned, the forested area that um, you sit, that, that the American company had bought the, it's undeveloped and so there's all the cobalt underneath it, right? So we were driving around through it. Um, a Chinese company owns it now, and they had just started um, going to town there and just bought it like just a couple months before the deal had gone through. We were driving through the thick, thick, thick forest until all of a sudden we weren't. And it was like a Martian landscape. The soil in this part of Congo is really rich in iron. So the soil is really red. And there was just nothing for miles and miles. We could see nothing but red soil. And um, it, there was kind of like this giant plateau of red soil in one area and we drove up it and we're looking around and we're like, where did this come from? And then we turned and drove in the opposite direction and we realized where it came from when we stopped at the lip of a giant canyon that was already being dug out. So this was the overfill, they call it, um, from the mine, um, from digging in. And there were literal bulldozers there, like it was like a giant hand clawing at the trees in the sides of the canyon. Maybe you've seen one of those photos already um, that show this. And um, the entire forest was being you know, torn down to make this mine. 
So now I, I can't tell you, you know, how many toxic chemicals go into rivers when mines get made um, a lot. Um, I we went to the village that was right on the outskirts of this mine. They already had been awakened one night and, when they heard the bulldozers coming and they knew what was headed for them, what their fate was. They knew that once seismic uh, things started, that the walls of their mud brick homes would crack and possibly fall down. They worried about their rivers where they got their drinking water being poisoned. Um, they uh, talked about how, you know, they, they were certain even that their fate would be like those at the Freeport McMoran mine, and they would probably get kicked off their land pretty soon. So let's be clear, this isn't a scenario that is specific to a Chinese mine site. All the mine sites have these issues, as I've so shown, but you might wonder, is China's dominance then in electric vehicles a problem? Well, it is if you're the US and you worry about being the world's most dominant global economic leader at this moment in time. It's a problem if you wanna be a leader in electric cars and in weaning the world off of fossil fuels. It's a problem if you worry that your supply of cobalt or batteries might be cut off at any minute by some kind of geopolitical issue. Now, we've seen how this has happened in Europe with uh, gas um, in, in terms of the war in Ukraine and how Russia has pinched that off. We've seen that with semiconductors um, and why we can't get new cars right now. <laughs> so when when but there are other problems um, with Chinese ownership of these mines. Um, I had talked to dozens of workers at Chinese controlled mines, including at the Tenkei Fungarume mine. They told me that the labor and safety practices at Chinese run mines were just way more different and way more haphazard than when the US company ran the mine and even way different from other international operators of mines in the area. When China Mali showed up on the site at Tenkei Fungarume, workers were literally, the Congolese workers were aghast. Some of the top level managers turned up in, in shirts, like t-shirts, shorts, and sneakers. These guys had had it drilled into their heads by the Freeport McMoran, by the US company that followed OSHA standards and was really concerned about um, you know, worker safety. They, everybody had to wear a hard hat all the time when you're on the mine site. There were signs everywhere, zero tolerance. They wore goggles, they wore steel-toed boots. Freeport had even swapped out their, their outfits, their boots, like every three or four months to just ensure the integrity of them. So to see managers come in in sneakers, they were really stunned. Um, and the Chinese firm that ran Freeport McMoran's old site, China Mali, did nothing. Um, so you might recall that I told you about the trespassers that were coming into the mine earlier and how tunnels collapsed and there were a lot of problems with Freeport, but the trespassers that came into um, China Mali's site, they called soldiers to come out and patrol the mine. And um, one, one, I... A couple of village leaders told me um, a very tragic story about the the miners and the I'm sorry the the trespassers and the soldiers played kind of a cat and mouse game from time to time, right? They would sneak in, soldiers would scare them off, they'd go back and forth. And um, there was some taunting and that kind of thing that went on. Well, one day the trespassers, they were probably just teenagers or early 20s, I believe, um, were throwing rocks at the soldiers. And the soldiers got mad and said, if you do that, one of them was like, if you do that again, I'm going to shoot you. He did it again and he shot him and he killed him. The, his friends carried his body home to the village. Um, and when they got to this little community uh, with the body of this man, um, a riot broke out. Um, people came from all over, there were protests, and the soldiers came in to control the crowds, and in doing that, shot and killed another person. And um, China Mali paid for the funerals of both of these people. But um, this was something that just hadn't happened uh, in that manner with soldiers in the past, at least. So one chief problem also that didn't occur with other mine operators from the U.S. or elsewhere is that Chinese companies, the Chinese companies, when they come in, often bring their own labor from China. So that meant jobs like low level jobs, um, right? Like um, drivers or cafeteria workers or housekeepers, all those jobs that in the past went to Congolese were now going to Chinese citizens. 
And that was really frustrating and you know life-changing for a lot of people. Um, also, the, the mine, some of the workers told me that when Freeport owned the mine, they were promoting a lot of people. There was like a career path up. Um, Freeport would offer a lot of training. They were, were sending middle-level managers all across the world to do training at their other mine sites. And that, there were no opportunities. That was just completely slammed shut. They felt like um, when China Mali bought the mine. So Chinese, or a lot of the Congolese people were out of work and the ones who stayed were very unhappy. But Chinese company just did not have the same high standards um, for safety either. Workers were operating the heavy equipment without the proper training. There were a lot of managers um, I talked to who in the safety division, um, you know, in charge of making sure worker safety, everything was on the up and up. They told me that when, when injuries would happen, there was a practice of taking those injured people off site to clinics outside of the borders of the mine to get treated instead of at the mines clinic. And I couldn't quite understand why that was happening. I thought, well, maybe the mines clinic just sucks and they went to a better clinic. But um, what we realized that they were doing is anyone who was treated on site of the mine um, that was reported to the certification authorities from abroad who you know would say like yes this mine is has a standard of safe labor and so the audits you know would show this and so if they were treated outside the clinic it wouldn't show it so they were kind of cheating this this standard that people had agreed upon um and the certification process so um, speaking of unsafe work sites, I want to tell you about another um, sector of the mining industry in Congo, and that is the artisanal or informal sector of cobalt mining. I've been talking to you about what happens at these huge industrial mines with heavy equipment, international owners, where operators are regulated or at least supposed to be regulated, where there are at least some kinds of checks. Um, but the hunt for cobalt has triggered a rush in another sector. And um, with the informal mining sector, it's basically they're at areas that have yet to be claimed or on more informal mines. And in all, all, the, all these are kind of areas that these investors at the fancy hotel I told you about at the beginning, that's what they're kind of looking for to get their hands on. Um, maybe mines owned by a local person or just unclaimed land. So when I talk about the informal mining sector in Congo, what I really mean is guys going out with a shovel and with a pickaxe and digging. Because if you live in a certain region in Congo, chances are that when your shovel hits the ground, you're gonna turn up some cobalt. And the people who live in Congo saw the bulldozers and trucks arriving. They weren't quite sure why cobalt was valuable, but they knew it was. And they, they knew that with all this fuss, it has to be worth something. So they rushed to the area in Southeast Congo and started digging. Now, some of this happened during the kind of first cobalt rush for iPhones and laptops, but it's it's still happening today. And we came across just driving up and down a high sec highway that bisects all the mines. Um, every time we would stop the car to get a snack or whatever we had to do, go talk to people, um, we would see people out digging. Um, we kept passing motorbike after motorbike. And maybe you've seen one of these images. It's a, a guy would be driving a motorbike and on the back of the motorbike were two giant bags of rocks, like kind of like gallon trash can type bags. And then another guy would be sitting on top of those two bags backwards, balancing as they drove. And those guys were trespassing on mines, um, the Tenke Fungarume mine, in fact. And they were dodging checkpoints. And they would, we would be driving on the highway and they would just pop out in front of us from fields of sunflowers. And um, scared us to death, but they, they were dodging checkpoints. They had this whole route. And that was just, we, we probably saw a hundred or more of these guys, um, on a couple different trips. So, um, every, every time, I'm sorry, little, little boys, um, were on one roadway that we passed. They were kind of bent over picking up rocks and we didn't know what they were doing. They had been following, um, a mining truck and those rocks, like from one of the industrial mines and those rocks had fallen off and they were just collecting the leftovers that were there. 
And, you know, that's because every single little bit of cobalt was valuable. One rock could maybe fetch a dollar or something and they would sell them. There was a line of about a mile long of these metal shacks, buying shacks, where um, they were operated by internationals and usually a Chinese operator in the many, many ones that we visited. And um, they would take the rocks and it was so loud in these places, you couldn't hear anything because they were um, using sledgehammers to pound the rocks and they would look inside the cobalt and um, someone would determine the grade and that was how they based the price. And um, this was where all the artisanal um, cobalt was sold. So I'll tell you this, which I thought was crazy, an entire fifth or more of the cobalt that comes from Con Congo is mined in this way. So it's not just the industrial mines. I mean, this plays a big, big role. It's not a bit player in the cobalt market at all. And one illustration I wanna tell you about um, of the craze for cobalt is this little town called Kasulo. When prices first spiked a few years back, Kasulo was this normal little farming village, nothing you know interesting um, other than that would distinguish it from other little villages around there. Um, someone was doing construction, though, on their home. I believe they were building a latrine. I'm not entirely sure. But um, they were digging out in their backyard and struck what passes for gold, a chunk of cobalt. So the guy poked around and he found even more. He told his neighbors. Word got out that the area was rich in cobalt, and soon people were digging up their own houses. And I heard stories about people digging straight down, you know, into their kitchens. Um, thousands of people came from miles around. It was this incredibly crazy little boom town that struck up. And mind you, this community was really, really poor. So a few big chunks could help, um, you know, fetch enough to feed a family for a week. When I arrived at Kasulu, it was an active mine site um, operated with the blessing of a state mining company. It was really just a series of tunnels and crude gashes um, the size of city blocks in the earth. It took me a minute to realize that this was once the actual literal village that I was looking at. Um, there were orange tarps that covered the holes to keep rain from going in, but really the only signs of village life that remained were um, a couple mango trees and a couple, I can never say this word, bougainvillea um, bushes, like the purple, beautiful purple flowers. Um, there were just a like a few of those things scattered among all this crazy like mining that was going on. Um, there were guys with bicycles. What, there were guys, you know, emerging from these tunnels with 200 and some pound bags of cobalt um, on their backs. They would hoist them up and put them on these old um, rusty bicycles on the handlebars and then wheel it across all the lumps of this mine and up the hill, um, up the lip of the mine, and then take it to a place where they would pound uh, the cobalt again to determine the grade and that the state ran the site, but they allowed a Chinese company to buy the cobalt that was found there from these miners. And the miners were in flip-flops um, or some of them bare feet. Some of them used little uh, headlamps, like the kind that you send a kid to a sleepover with or a camping trip, like the plastic ones. A lot of them, one guy I talked to um, had, uh, had scars on his legs and he, from, you know, just injuries that he'd had um, in that way. And he was particularly interesting because he had started his life in the diamond mines when he was 14 and he was 41, I think now, and was still working. Like he just chased, he told me he just chased um, whatever craze it was for whatever mineral and metal his whole life. And he was so sick of it. And he was like, if there was any other way, I would do anything besides this, but I want to put my kids through school. That was his main goal. And he wanted to do that so that they didn't have the kind of life that he had. I was really, um, he was a really interesting guy. So I think that, uh, so uh, they were, so the Chinese company, well, the government basically was allowing bulldozers to come in every so often and level the tunnels so that uh, they didn't collapse. That was their safety plan there. So it was sort of loosely regulated, right? And the government had really big plans for this to be um, the poster child for safe artisanal mining. They wanted to formalize a payment system to cut down on fraud instead of paying workers by cash and by piecemeal. 
they were going to issue uniforms and hard hats and, you know, boots and all this other equipment. But as far as I know, that hasn't really moved forward just yet. And even if it did, it would only be one little slice of the whole informal sector that's in need of reforming. So we should talk about where all this cobalt ends up. Remember when I told you um, that Chinese officials had a plan kind of like Henry Ford to control the whole process of automobile making? Well, a huge part of their plan is battery making. Almost every major battery maker um, making plant in the world is in China right now. Nearly all the cobalt mined in Congo, either by <clears throat> industrial mines or informal miners just out there digging, it all ends up in China because they control the industry right now. And that's how we can't be sure that even if a mine says it has safe labor practices and has all and does all the right things, we can't be sure that a battery that we buy comes from a safe um, environment because in China, all the cobalt arrives in these big cargo ships and gets mixed together in the wash basically when they when they're doing um, making the batteries. So, so the same is true, by the way, for diamonds. And some of you in the audience can probably explain this better than me, but almost all diamonds, no matter where they come from, small diamonds, are cut and polished in centers in India where everything is all mixed together. We can't ever be sure any diamond we wear was mined in a responsible way. I think that you can make a case, um, you, despite all the marketing, that there's no such thing right now as an ethical diamond. And so just like we have had in the past blood diamonds, people call cobalt, um, cobalt, like blood, what do they call it? Blood, blood, cobalt, blood batteries. So, so, I mean, this is a cycle that's happened over and over that we've seen happen that we, um, you know, can't, can't seem to figure it out. So how can we break this cycle? I'm not sure if U.S. involvement in Congo would make things better. But our stories got the attention of the government here and of the Biden administration. The US has ratcheted up its involvement in Congo after years of few or no visits from high level officials. A deputy undersecretary for the labor department has visited and um, made a bunch of grants to try to improve labor um, safety there in a lot of industries, including the mines. Secretary of State Blinken visited this year Climate envoy John Kerry was just in um, Congo attending a climate conference. The economic department of the embassy now has, I think, like six full-time actual diplomats working in it. And America has taken steps to create new battery factories within its own borders. The new climate legislation has money for that and for other electric vehicle manufacturing. New methods of making batteries that don't use as much cobalt are in the works and are already well on their way. But overall, people are paying attention to the situation. And in Congo, also, also just a couple of weeks ago, Blinken announced um, a plan that he might do for more American financing of mining interests overseas. Um, so in Congo, the president, Felix Chisichetti, has put in motion investigations of that $6 billion deal they struck, the minerals for um, infrastructure deal they struck over because Congo says it didn't get what China promised. China had promised roads and schools and all that. And they say that um, they haven't delivered everything. And just the other week, Congo announced a plan to build its own battery factory within its own borders near the mines, which would be amazing if that happened. But I'm not sure if Congo can go it alone. Only 17% of the entire country has electricity right now. You can stand on a hill in Kinshasa, the capital of uh, some 17 million people. You can you can look. I when I was staying at the fancy Fleuve, I looked out my hotel window, which overlooked you know the city, and it's almost total darkness in a capital city. Congo needs to develop, and it needs financial help to do that. Congo recently announced a very controversial new plan to sell oil and gas blocks. Some of the blocks overlap with a guerrilla sanctuary, Virunga, and carbon absorbing peat areas. So Congo, in addition to its minerals and metals and gems, also has another amazing resource, its forest. It's the part of the Congo River Basin. It has a huge swath of Congo Basin old growth rainforest in, in its borders. And that is the carbon that 
you know, it sucks in like all America's polluting carbon. So, um, and it's second to the Amazon in, um, in size. And as the Amazon flips from carbon absorber to carbon emitter, the Congo River Basin is really one of our last great hopes. And I think that it's clear, um, you know, that this country with its vast rainforest, it's how it observes, uh, absorbs Europe and America's carbon. Um, and it has a Congo River that if it's harnessed correctly could provide electricity for not just Congo, but for almost the entire continent in a clean and reliable, in clean and renewable way. Um, and with its amazing supply of minerals and metals, it's not too much of a stretch to say that Congo and the other countries of the Congo River Basin could be ground zero for saving the planet. So it's important that we pay attention and see how this plays out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and answer any questions that might be in the chat or in the room. If you do have a question, please um, put it put it in the Q and A or the chat. And I'll ask the first question from the chat for you and come back up. Um, given the increasing great demand for cobalt, where are its world reserves? When are its world reserves expected to be de depleted? And is there a foreseeable replacement? I used to know the answer to that question, um, how much cobalt there was, but I don't remember it exactly. But for now, um, there are a lot of companies that are trying to make um, batteries that are, they're trying to manufacture cobalt out of batteries. And um, that is well on its way. It's The problem is, is they're not really quite ready for prime time yet and a lot of the a lot of batteries that don't use as much cobalt can't go as far but um this is in the works and um a lot of people are putting their brains to it to try to figure it out but you know th there's also i didn't even talk about lithium and all these other minerals and metals that are still going to be required and that have their own sets of problems in in other countries yeah Hi, um, one, uh, you're a very good speaker. This was really engaging and interesting. So thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you. Um, I'm a public health student at, at Rollins getting the MPH in environmental health specifically. And so we talk a lot about um, contaminated waterways specifically mm. in terms of mining. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the health outcomes uh, for the miners and the families and everyone who's living in that region, both from the act of mining as well as um, contamination of waterways or other uh, sources of contamination. We we didn't spend as much time looking at that. It just got a little overwhelming. We produced five stories on this and the fact that we got the New York Times to run some like, you know, five, 25,000 words on Congo, we were, you know, happy with. But um, we we did hear stories. Um, Glencore had, I think it's Glencore, um, had a uh, mining incident, an incident where rivers were, I mean, the, all the all the mines have incidents all the time where there's stuff that's leached into um, rivers and other places. It's a huge problem. I don't know, I don't have any stats. I don't know if people have studied it. I'm sure they have, but we heard a lot of incidents of this happening. Um, even I think I recall uh, just some of the new equipment that some of the companies had taken, that company that had taken over Tenke Fungarume um, was being used in ways like, like guys were going down to scrub vats of stuff without the proper um, safety equipment on their faces and respirators and stuff. So, I mean, obviously they're huge, huge environmental impacts. I mean, just seeing that forest completely destroyed that we saw was stunning. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a problem. It's just, I mean, there, there are a million different problems with, uh, with in places, especially when it's not as regulated. Um, and, and I'm sure there are problems, you know, in America too, obviously a lot of mining problems and, and beyond. So, <laughs> mm -hmm.
थैंक यू आई एम एन एनवायरमेंटल साइंस मेजर माय नेम इज तुषार सो आई वाज जस्ट वंडरिंग द सो आई मीन यू नो देयर इज अ लॉट देयर आर अ लॉट ऑफ रेबल फैक्शंस विद इन लाइक यू नो इन अदर अफ्रीकन कंट्रीज एज़ वेल एंड दे ऑल आर वाइंग फॉर यू नो कंट्रोल फॉर कंट्रोल ओवर वेरियस माइंस सो आई वाज वंडरिंग व्हाट रोल डू रेबल फैक्शंस प्ले इन द स्ट्रगल फॉर मिनरल्स फाउंड इन द डीआरसी Well um that's there there's a lot of problems right now in the east of DRC but I actually don't know that much about it um I've done logging in DRC that's what I spent the year working on is um illegal logging mostly on um, there and uh the year before on mines and the rebel control I mean they're fighting in areas of Virunga um and uh that's that's a problem right now too but I'm not quite sure I think it's gold though but I could be wrong So sorry I just know I know there are problems there so and you're right it's almost like like that seems to be at the heart of many 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 fights in the Central African Republic um diamonds really have torn that nation to bits and pieces and now Russian involvement there with the Wagner group has been a big problem too Uh so I uh, put one of Putin's oligarch buddies I guess it's his former chef um uh has a mercenary group called the Wagner group and they um moved when I was in Central African Republic they moved into um there and kind of created this this soft power thing but in in Central African Republic um the military has is not armed or was not armed for many years the UN kind of took away their arms because of bad things that they had done um so they were training literally with like sticks um their soldiers um so the Russians were allowed to come in and give them training um with they not with will rep will re real weapons but they were they were getting all this training they were providing all kinds of other kinds of military support and they Russians you know have done that in many countries now they're in Mali um i think in Burkina Faso and um are striking deals um much in the same way that America did many years ago um so they've kind of filled that void China and Russia in a lot of um African countries Right they are they are there's that really crazy video of their of uh the head of the Wagner group um talking to the yeah look it up <laughs> it's pretty interesting so yeah there's another question mm -hmm. in the chat um to what extent did you place yourself in danger with your investigative journalism um I didn't really feel um that in danger um you know we got the mine the forest where we were where we weren't supposed to be we um we got detained by mining security and i thought oh this could be bad because we're really not supposed to be here but um basically i uh, the local colleague that i work with and the photographer ashley gilberson whose images they showed you are hilarious and they just talked to that guy until they were blue in the face and he was so sick of us he just sent us on our way so i mean there are many strategies of getting out of trouble that was probably the the worst i mean honestly i think the worst danger that i well the worst one of the most dangerous things is driving you know is driving up and down roads we saw um you might have seen images of overturned trucks of acid um and so it's it's a really dangerous highway and um but yeah we were a little worried we were maybe getting a little too close to the bone um talking about chinese companies but sometimes when i'm in dangerous situations like that when i was in the central africa republic i really tried to see what i could see on the ground and then saved my hard questions for when i was home and could call people that doesn't always work because a lot of times face to face meetings people won't talk to you unless you're in their office but um it works sometimes so um that's that's one strategy i have understanding that like economic mobility and things like that there's like a really like principal concern among local people is there also like a concern or recognition that mining has negative impacts on the environment and if there's environmental advocates um in the area is it safe for them to be advocating for stronger environmental protections or is it unsafe in a way that we see in like a lot of places in south america 
Yeah, there are activists for sure. And I think they would tell you that they don't always feel safe. Um, you know, especially it depends on the political situation. It depends on the area. There were a lot of allegations of um, Chinese abuse of Congolese workers um, not that long ago, maybe in the past year or so, a lot of videos that were emerging um, of this. I, I, I don't know if they were verified or not, but um, people were really, really upset um, by by what they said were some beatings and that kind of thing. And um, there was kind of an uprising. And I think it actually did make a difference because I think the president paid attention to it. That he, um, you know, he's looking into that big mining deal that I told you, the middle, minerals and metals for infrastructure deal. But he also has, there are also allegations against the Chinese company, China Mali, and that Tenke Fungurume mine that they'd been hiding reserves from the government and you know their their whole concession or whatever is based on like the amount of reserves they think they have the amount they pull out of the ground in partnership with the state mining company and how much basically taxes the governor or the government can get out of it and their allegations that they were hiding reserves it gets really complicated i looked into it and i would bore you to death if i talked about it but um but uh that's one thing that the president for a while at least was pushing really hard on that investigation of that i think he's maybe backed off some i'm not quite sure what is at play right now but um that's still in the works and maybe our last question for the night um did you see any Yeah, for sure. I met with civil society groups, they're called, like local nonprofits, basically, that work there. Um, there are researchers from all over the world that are going in and looking at labor conditions. Um, yeah, that, that there's a very active local, um, you know, as far as labor activism, environmental activism, Greenpeace has a branch there um, that uh, uh, there's a woman who runs that branch there. She's really cool. Um, and I just think there are, yeah, for sure, there's there's definitely a scene there um, of of pushing back. And and I think a lot of frustration, too. I would think a lot of frustration that people feel that um, their voices aren't being heard. And it's an election year coming up. So some pe the people in power are thinking about other things. There's a rebel uprising, almost a civil war with Rwanda. I mean, Congo has so much going on. And um, then there are people like me poking at them. So, I mean, I think that um, they have... Yeah, it's a really interesting place right now, but I, it's just, I'm so happy that you all are interested in it. <laughs> so it's, it's a really interesting place. One quick, mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Uh, one quick question, because I, even before I knew about this lecture, I was interested in um, on this, this topic uh, issue. We're trading one thing for another, it seems, but uh, it was about children being sent down into the mines because they're small enough. I don't know if it was cobalt. I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Is that is that was something yeah, you saw? The, I, didn't, I didn't see pictures. The tunnels are pretty narrow, and and so I mean, and I don't, they don't have to be narrow. I think it's just harder to dig, right? So if you, it's less work, and so if you have a skinny little tunnel, you can send a skinny little person down there easier. So child labor has been a big problem at the mine site that I was at. Um, the government said that um, you had to be eighteen and over to work at, so it was quasi regulated, but you know that was happening. But it was also happening in really like more subtle ways like those little boys picking up rocks um you know that kind of thing was was happening too and i mean a lot of people really argued that they wanted to put their kids to work like parents like that was part of their income it's child labor i think is like it's a little more complicated than it might seem in the in in the you know just from the surface level if you really start talking to people on the ground about this situation so um I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. But um, yeah, I think regulation could help. Yeah, I can speak some French, but I do use interpreters um, for sure. Um, and and not just for language, but just like, tell me what's really going on. I, I'm really close uh, partners with um, a local journalist there that I work very closely with who helped me out a lot. Thank you. Thanks.